By the time of Homer, the ancient Greeks thought the earth was flat and shaped like a disk. By 580 BC, Pythagoras suggested that, that the earth was a sphere. In the 3rd century BC, Dicarchus added to this and had said that the known world was longer from east to west than from north to south. Cartography, the art and science of drawing maps that represent our earth, has a long history. For much of its history, it was used to turn the unknown into the known and make sure that even the most distant places found could be visited again. When Pythagoras made the Earth a sphere, cartography began to serve two purposes, to represent the flat world bound by its terrestrial features and to farm useful to travelers and merchants. The second purpose was to represent the Earth on a flat map as accurately as possible, even with the many distortions that come with drawing a round sphere on a flat surface. Eratosthenes, around 200 BC, calculated the Earth's circumference with a 4% accuracy and then created a map extending from Europe to Asia. Mariners of Tyre and Claudius Ptolemy in the 1st century AD contributed charts for Mariners and the first atlas respectively. Ptolemy's work gained him the reputation of being one of the greatest early cartographers. His world map extended from Britain and northwestern Africa in the west to India and the Malay Peninsula in the east. Ptolemy's maps were of little interest to the Romans, however, and they were forgotten for over a thousand years until they were rediscovered in 1400 and had a great influence on 15th and 16th century geographers. Progress in navigation like the wind rose and magnetic compass showed up by the 13th century. Portugal, under Prince Henry the Navigator, led in map making during the 15th century. Prince Henry's discovery of the Madeira Islands in the Azores far in the Atlantic Ocean and his exploration of the West African coast sparked the age of discovery for new lands. The 15th century saw more wayfinding improvements, like improving the magnetic compass. Some explorers, like Christopher Columbus, chose to rely on outdated estimates nonetheless. His misunderstandings allowed him to misinterpret the size of the Earth and the distance he traveled. When he landed in the Caribbean in 1492, he believed that he landed in Asia. Around 1500, Portugal and Spain set up offices for trade and exploration control. Pedro Nunez in 1530 realized the problem with mapping the sphere, but it was Gerardus Mercator who solved it in 1569 with his groundbreaking projection. Mercator's projection used a rectangular grid of latitude and longitude. This projection made it easier to draw room lines a complicated curve on the Earth's surface that crosses every meridian at the same oblique angle, a crucial part of wayfinding. In the 16th century, map making moved to the Netherlands. Abraham Ortelius published the first true atlas in 1570 based on Ptolemy's projection. The thoughts of famous ancient Greek thinkers like Aristotle and Ptolemy ruled much of Europe's thoughts about science until the scientific revolution and the age of enlightenment began to make Europeans change their ways of thinking. When looking at the world maps of Ptolemy, Mercator, or Atelius, a common design pattern can be seen. A large, sprawling landmass occupies much of the southern hemisphere, adorned with the Latin name of Terra Australis Incognita, or in English, Southern Land Unknown. But how did Europeans know that the land existed here? when not one of their ships explored there. Aristotle first introduced, or deduced, the idea that the world was top-heavy. There was too much land, Eurasia, in the north. But it was top-heavy, he thought, then the world would have fallen over already. Therefore, there must have been a large piece of land in the south to act as a counterweight. Ptolemy expanded upon this idea by saying that the Indian Ocean was enclosed by this large chunk of land to the south an idea reflected in his map. Expanding from the coast of East Africa, a long coastline stretches to the shores of distant China. Even the Atlantic was similarly closed. The legitimacy of Aristotle's and Ptolemy's ideas went unchallenged as the age of discovery continued, though how Terra Australis was represented on the map certainly changed. Columbus's arrival in the Americas, or Asia as he thought, pushed Ptolemy's mythical Atlantic boundary much farther west. America Vespucci's mapping of the New World in 1499 disputed Columbus's idea that he reached Asia, but instead actually landed on a whole new continent. 
for America's discovery, the New World was named after him, America. In the East, Ptolemy's idea that the Indian Ocean was more of a large enclosed sea was disproven when several Portuguese explorers, first Pero de Covila, then Bartholomew Diaz, sailed farther down the African coast. In 1497, Vasco da Gama was the first around the Cape of Good Hope in southern Africa and made landfall in India. Vasco da Gama's achievement, and more Portuguese explorations along Africa, became reflected in Lobo Homem's 1519 map of the world, which showed that Terra Australis was, was now an extension of South America rather than Africa. Though a direct sea route to India had been set up, this did not deter others from seeing the Americas as little more than an obstacle to a western route to Asia. From 1519 to 1521, Ferdinand Magellan hoped to achieve the same goals as Columbus. Sailing from Spain and then along the coast of Brazil, his hopes that the Rio de la Plata was a passage was explored in vain. Sailing southward, he and his ships eventually found a strait leading westward, but it was long, deep, and torturous. Regardless, he pressed on. After a month of careful navigation, he sailed out, he sailed out onto the open ocean a comparatively much calmer body of water than what he just sailed through, and for this he named his ocean the Pacific, or Peaceful. What was hoped to be a short voyage to India became a 14 week long journey of traveling the vast ocean. In March of 1521, Magellan reached the Philippine Islands where he was killed in a scuffle. Only one of his five ships eventually returned to Spain, completing the first circumnavigation of the earth. Magellan's crossing of the Straits of Magellan, separating the Tierra del Fuego from the South American continent, proved to cartographers that Terra Australis did not, did not extend from South America, though there was room for confusion, leading many to believe that the island was part of the southern continent. This discovery was, again, reflected in new maps. The maps of Mercator and Australis now saw Terra Australis become a whole continent separated only by that one strait. Archelaus' map featured place names on Terra Australis that were drawn from Marco Polo's travels, names like Beach, Lukak, and Maltur, but these were actually places somewhere in, in Indochina. In the 15th and 16th centuries, sailors from Europe, like the Portuguese, Spanish, and Dutch, were fascinated by the appeal of spices from Southeast Asia. Spices were highly sought after in Europe for making bland food tasty and helping with food preservation. The Spice Islands, located around the Moluccas in Indonesia, became a center of exploration. Arab traders first introduced Europeans to nutmeg and cloves from this region. The Portuguese gained access to the Moluccas by sailing to Malacca in the early 1500s. While the Spanish were initially busy with discovering America, they reached the Spice Islands in 1521 after Magellan's Pacific Crossing. Conflict with the Portuguese in the area resulted in the Treaty of Zaragoza in 1529. Portugal got the Moluccas, and Spain took the Philippines. Magellan's journey raised questions about Terra Australis in the South Pacific. Alvaro de Mandana explored the Solomon Islands in 1567, later finding the Marquesas and Santa Cruz Islands in 1595. Pedro Fernandez de Quiros explored the Pacific War in 1605, reaching the island of Espiritu Santo in the Vanuatu group, mistakenly thinking he found the southern continent. Quiros's companion, Luis de Vez de Torres, sailed through a strait between Australia and New Guinea, confirming New Guinea as an island. However, this was kept a secret by Spain and remained untold until James Cook's voyage in 1770. The Dutch also had an interest in the spice trade. In 1579, the Republic of the United Netherlands was formed by seven northern provinces in the Low Countries, uniting against Spanish rule. The Republic severed ties with the Spanish crown in 1581, leading to conflicts over trade routes, especially in the spice trade, and colonial possessions. By the end of the Eighty Years' War in 1648, the Dutch gained dominance in Asia over Spain and Portugal. The Dutch United East India Company, or the VOC, was established in 1602 to grow Dutch interests in the East, particularly in the spice trade. 
they gained a nutmeg monopoly on the Banda Islands and captured the chief Spice Islands. Wilhelm Zoon, a Dutch explorer, sailed on the ship Stijufken in 1606 to explore the southern coast of New Guinea for economic reasons. However, he was redirected south by the shoals of the Torres Strait. Yanzun continued along what is now called the Cape York Peninsula, reaching Cape Kavir. At Port Musgrave, Yanzun and his crew had the first recorded contact with the first Australians, resulting in a fatal spear incident. Yanzun's voyage happened only a few months before Luis Vez de Torres' journey through the Torres Strait. With no economic benefit, the Dutch abandoned Cape York and shifted their focus to the western Australian coast. Most Dutch voyages to the East Indies went through the northern Indian Ocean, but a new route by Henrik Bauer became standard starting in 1617. Bauer's route went through the southern Indian Ocean and then north. However, since there was no reliable way to accurately measure longitude at the time, this led to cases where Dutch ships following the new route could find themselves in accidental landfalls and contacts in Western Australia, such as the case of Dirk Hartog. Dirk Hartog, in 1616, landed on Dirk Hartog Island and left evidence of his visit in the form of a pewter plate. In 1623, Jan Stens and Willem Jutzenk van Kostenstadt were sent to explore New Guinea and Northern Australia by the Dutch. This mission mirrored Yan Zun's journey nearly 20 years earlier. They followed Yan Zun's 1606 route through the Torres Strait, but thought exploring shoals and reefs too risky. While sailing down the Gulf of Carpentaria, they closely observed the coast, making contact with the first Australians on nine occasions. Kirsten studied first Australian life, but found nothing valuable for trade. He described the people as pitch black, lean, and naked resembling those from the coast of Coromandel, but seemingly less cunning and ill-natured than those on the west coast of New Guinea. Carstens intended to bring back some first Australians, but when his men attempted to seize one, it turned chaotic. Carstens recounted how a large group of over 200 men, well prepared to confront them, forced him to fire shots. The altercation ended with the locals fleeing due to injuries. Facing water and wood shortages near the Staten River, Carstens decided to turn back. Kustert and his ship abandoned the expedition, heading northwest across the gulf. Carstens continued along the coast, naming landmarks such as the Nassau River and Cohen River. In the 1620s, more Dutch ships explored the coast of Australia. The stand-up visits were made by the Golden Zippard and the Batavia. The Golden Zippard, led by Francois Dussien, explored the southern coast in 1627. Sailing from the Cape of Good Hope, Dissian mapped over 1,800 kilometers of coast, displaying the idea that Australia was connected to a landmass near the South Pole. The Batavia's voyage in 1629 is perhaps more notorious due to the dramatic events that happened after they shipped wrecked on the Hootman Albros Islands. On the way to Batavia, a mutiny led by Adrian Jacobson occurred. The ship ran aground on Morning Reef, leaving some survivors on the islands. A rescue ship, the Sardam, arrived on September 13th. However, they found a grim scene. One mutineer, Jeremonius Cornelius, had, or had orchestrated a campaign of terror, resulting in the murder of 125 men, women, and children, with more casualties when the ship broke up. On High Island, survivors, led by Webby Hayes, built a stone enclosure for defense against Cornelius' men. The Sardam forced the mutineers to surrender, and after a brief trial, nine mutineers were executed. Seventy-four survivors returned to Batavia on the Sardam. Two mutineers, Walter Luce and Jan Pilgrimus de Bay, were left on the Australian mainland, near the mouth of the Murchison River, becoming Australia's first European residents, though they were never seen again. In 1636, the VOC Governor General Anthony Van Diemen took a significant step to learn more about the coast. He sent Peter Peterson and Garrett Thomas Poole to explore and study the southern coast. They also had other tasks, like checking Yan Zun's route to the Torres Strait, searching for the two mutineers on the west coast, and finding a good spot for VOC ships to resupply. Unfortunately, Poole died on the New Guinea coast, and Peter Peterson took charge. 
Governor General Van Diemen continued to expand Dutch knowledge about southern Australia and find new routes to the Pacific without Spanish influence. In 1642, he chose Abel Janhoon's Tasman for a new exploration. Tasman sailed below Cape Lewin, reached the Tasmanian coast, and aimed at Anthony Van Diemen's land. The journey went on to map western New Zealand before returning. After coming back to Batavia, the VOC council thought Tasman's work wasn't enough and sent him on another trip in 1644. Tasman explored New Guinea's southern coast, crossed Torres Strait, went through the Gulf of Carpentaria, and accurately mapped the entire northern Australian coast, giving a full understanding of the region. It is during these travels that the land we now call Australia got the name New Holland. In 1656, the Dutch ship Bergul Trek, under Peter Albert's command, ran aground off Flag Point near Cape Nationalt. All the rescue ships were dispatched, they did not find any survivors. More searches and expeditions in 1658 also yielded no results, and the fate of the very good drag stayed a mystery until 1963. Nearly 30 years later, in 1696, a new exploration was sent to find another mission ship, the Rudderschap the Van Holland. The expedition reached the West Australian coast with Captain William D. Fleming charting their area and exploring the Swan River. D. Fleming's journey also contributed to the growing scientific knowledge about Australia. His men reported seeing a yellow dog jump out of the scrub and throw itself into the sea as if to enjoy a swim, and described the koalkas of Rottnest Island as rats' greatest cats, all of which had a kind of bag or purse hanging from the throat upon their breast downwards. By the 1700s, Dutch interest in Australia waned. Fears of British intentions in Northern Australia prompted an expedition in 1505 to establish a Dutch presence along the northern coast. The last Dutch ship to find itself wrecked on the Australian coast was the Sea Wick in 1727, but luckily some crew members built a small ship named Slopey to sail back home, the first known European vessel built in Australia. The final Dutch expedition to Northern Australia occurred in 1756, but achieved little. After repeated failures to survey the northern coast, the Dutch abandoned their interest in Australia. While it is commonly accepted that the Dutch were the first Europeans to come across Australia, there is a possibility that the Portuguese were the first to beat them through the punch. This claim goes back to the Dieppe maps, several maps by French cartographers between 1542 and 1587, at minimum nearly 30 years before Jan Zoon's exploration in 1606. These maps seem to have a Portuguese origin, given that many place names were Portuguese, even though no maps directly from Portugal show what is on these French ones. One place name in particular, Java La Grande, is a cornerstone of the argument. People have been wondering if Javala Grand is on these maps is, in fact, Australia. A more recent take on these Dieppe maps by Kenneth McIntyre suggests that these are the east coast of Australia, with landmarks like Botany Bay supposedly charted by Cristoval de Madonna in the 1520s. McIntyre also points to physical evidence along, along Australia's coast. The Caronade Island guns, two 15th and 16th century guns of, of Portuguese origin, as McIntyre claims, are actually from Southeast Asia. The one and bow wreck is another piece of evidence. McIntyre claims that they are the remains of Cristobal de Mondona's ships. However, whether the ship is Portuguese stays a mystery with no solid proof. Another of McIntyre's evidence is the Berangabi ruins, a fortress supposedly built during the Portuguese expedition. However, these ruins were part of wheeling and pastoral interest in the region in the 1840s. It is possible that Javala Grand might not even be Australia. At the time of the 1500s Dieppe maps, it was common for small scale maps of coastlines to be combined to create maps covering much larger areas. Javala Grand, therefore, could be a mix of places like Western Java and Vietnam. The answer to the question of was Australia first discovered by the Dutch or the Portuguese is a personal one. Until truly solid evidence proves that the Portuguese were the first Europeans to discover the continent, popular history will say that the Dutch were first.
The allure of Terra Australis Incognita as being a hidden part of the world, discovered but not yet fully known, has allowed the authors of the 17th and 18th centuries to let their minds run wild with the dreams of life on the southern land. Fictional stories about Terra Australis of the time took place in the form of imaginary voyages, where the main character describes their journeys and visits in the, as they portrayed it, utopian paradise in the south. The modern idea of a utopia originates in turn Thomas More's book simply titled Utopia, a 1516 rewrite of Plato's Republic. More's utopia was a distant island with total religious toleration, no private property, free education for all, including women, and other phenomena like no poverty or want. It was a satire on the, on the state of Europe and England at the time, a land divided by religion, self-interest, and greed for power and riches. The idea that Terra Australis was Morse Utopia became solidified with the journey to Terra Australis made by Pedro Fernandez de Quiros in 1505, though he only discovered the island of Espiritu Santo in the Vanuatu group. Quiros' life was deeply intertwined with Catholicism, and he saw his voyages as a mission to spread the faith. His loyalty to millenarianism, the world view that there is an imminent golden age of, of blessedness, influenced his actions. When he landed on Espiritu Santo, Kiros described a self-sustaining, harmonious paradise on, on the island. Despite the idyllic portrayal, Kiros' rose-tinted perception was shaped more by hope and dream than a thorough survey of the land, which would tell him that it was far from it. Nonetheless, he continued to praise his, his discovery of paradise on earth until he died in 1615. Kiros' tales and Moore's utopia took the form of fictional traveler's tale literature that became havens for controversial ideas and taboo fantasies of the time. Richard Brum's play, The Antipodes, satirizes the excesses of Puritanism, presenting an anti-London where everything goes contrary to norms. Wives rule their husbands, servants govern their masters, old men go to school again, maids do woo the bachelor, and tis more probable, the wives lie uppermost. Peregrine, the marrying character, experiences hallucinations of being in the Antipodes, the medieval name for Terra Australis. Henry Neville's Terra Australis, the Isle of the Pines, served as a catalogue of the ills of European monarchies of the time. Neville's work circulated widely in Europe and explored themes of sexuality. He depicted the consequences of unrestrained behavior in a utopian setting turned dystopian. Dennis Fierce's The History of the Severambians described an ideal society on Terra Australis, focusing on religious tolerance and reason. However, this seemingly utopian society had dystopian elements, showcasing the dangers of the loss of individual freedom. Gabriel de Funes, The Southern Land Known used Terra Australis as a metaphor for ideological, di ideological division and remoteness. His work strikes back at the political and religious absolutism of late 1600s Europe. Jonathan Swift, in, in 1726, took the parodying the Traveler's Tale genre with his book Travels into Several Remote, remote Nations of the World in Four Parts by Lemuel Gulliver, popularly known as Gulliver's Travels. Partially set on the fictional islands of Lilliput and Bolevsku, which Swift placed in Australia, Gulliver's Travels serves as a satire on human nature. Terra Australis became a perfect backdrop for writers to write stories that criticized their religions, societies, and governments, as well as exploring themes of human sexuality. In the pursuit of an ideal society, individual rights in these books were often sacrificed for the greater good, a haunting protection of life under future repressive governments. The Dutch, or maybe even the Portuguese, were not the first to have a go at Terra Australis. The English first came across Australia when the trial, on its way from Britain to the East Indies, got stuck off the coast of Western Australia. Some of the crew members managed to sail back to Batavia, but unfortunately, more than 97 people were left to fend for themselves. The next contact was in 1681, when Captain John Daniel cruised in on the London and mapped the Hootman Albrolls the first English charting of Australia. Then, in 1688, the Kignette, captained by William Dampier, hit the northwest coast. Dampier was skilled in maritime adventures 
and considered himself to be an amateur scientist. Dampier's keen eye for detail, especially when it came to the first Australians and the local wildlife, made him popular. In 1697, in his book A New Voyage Round the World, Dampier shaped how Europeans saw Australian indigenous culture for over two centuries, even if some of his descriptions were a bit on the critical side. As he wrote in 1688, the inhabitants of this country are the merciless people in the world. The Hodmadods of Onomatapa, though a nasty people, yet for wealth are gentlemen to these. They have no houses or skin garments, sheep poultry, fruits of the earth, ostrich eggs, etc., as Hodmadods have. And setting aside their human shape, they differ little from brutes. Their eyelids are always half closed to keep the flies out of their eyes, they being so troublesome here that no fanning will keep them from coming to one's face. Dampier's voyage and the later wave of Australian exploration happened during an exciting era for science. The 17th century saw the scientific revolution spread through Western Europe. Over in Britain, the Royal Society turned into a buzzing hub where all scientists could chat about their ideas, push research forward, and publish their findings. France had a similar club, the Académie des Sciences. These societies acted as the scientific advisors to their respective governments. The two were especially all in on science as they went hand in hand with colonialism, commercial expansion, and flexing their muscles over the globe. The aftermath of the Seven Years' War in 1763 left plants licking their wounds as they had to give up most of their colonies in North America and India to the British. Thanks to these acquisitions, the British Empire began to grow into a truly global empire. Louis de Bougainville, a French explorer, thought to snag the Falkland Islands, which would allow France to control the South Atlantic sea routes and counter Britain. The settlement was privately funded, but had official thumbs up. But in 1765, Bougainville bumped into a British Pacific expedition at the Falcons. The British claimed the Falcons and under some diplomatic pressure, the French had to hand them over to the Spanish. After, Bougainville set his sights on the Pacific. In 1768, he kicked off the first official French voyage into the Pacific. He almost staked a claim on the Australian east coast, but his limited resources meant risking his ships on the Great Barrier Reef could spell disaster. More French expeditions decided to brave the Australian east coast. Joseph Antoine Bruni d'Entrecasteaux's journey in 1791 is notable as it expanded upon Europe's knowledge on Australian plants and wildlife. No explorer of the time could quite match up to the legendary Lieutenant James Cook. Tasked by the British Admiralty, Cook took the helm of the HMS Endeavour with a primary mission to see the transit of Venus in Tahiti. When that was done, he was to go hunt down Terra Australis. If he did stumble upon a new continent, Cook was tasked to gather intel on the land, its treasures, its wildlife, and its indigenous people. If the locals were cool with it, he was allowed to plant the Union Jack and claim the land for Britain. To make sure this voyage was repaired, the Royal Society chipped in with astronomers and scientists. Post Venus transit, Cook set sail and hit the east coast of New Zealand in October 1769. For the next half year, he did a full lap around both islands charting them on the map. When thoughts turned to heading home to Britain, Cook decided to see what lay on the east coast of Australia. The first land that popped up was named Point Hicks. From there, it was a steady survey marathon north, averaging around 30 miles a day, coming across places like Botany Bay, where he met first Australians. Even when faced with the Great Barrier Reef, Cook still sailed. He saw the way between Australia and New Guinea skillfully navigating the Torres Strait, even nearly avoiding a reef. Despite hiccups along the way, Cook's expedition laid down Australia's basic geography. Later British missions polished up the coastlines around the Torres Strait and Tasmania. Matthew Flinders, in particular, circled all of Australia by 1803, proving that New Holland was a standalone continent from Terra Australis. Because of this, Flinders suggested swapping out the name New Holland for Australia. Australia likely would have been called Terra Napoleon if it weren't for the death of its namesake. At the same time of Flinders circumnavigation, the French, under Nicolas Baldin, had also been sent to Australia to chart the southern coast. After circumnavigating Australia, Flinders was imprisoned on the island of Mauritius and found out that French names were already being given to places that he had discovered. 
By the time of Napoleon Bonaparte's death in 1821, English names had been applied instead. Britain's settlement of Australia set out a few years before Flinders circumnavigation. In 1786, the British government decided to set up the colony of New South Wales, and by early 1788, colonization was underway. Since the loss of its American colonies, which previously accepted transported felons, Britain aimed to alleviate pressure on its prisons back home by turning New South Wales into a penal colony. The Australian settlement also served as a stronghold for British sea power in the eastern seas, and to claim the land before France could. Plans went ahead under the guidance of Thomas Townshed, the Sec Secretary of State for Home Affairs. Arthur Phillip led the expedition, tasked with taking control of the territory from Cape York to Tasmania with near absolute power. Their first fleet, with 11 vessels and around 730 convicts, reached Botany Bay by January 1788. Due to poor soil and little water, Philip moved the fleet north to Port Jackson, where Sydney Cove became the focal point for the settlement, evolving into the city of Sydney. Philip remained governor of New South Wales until December 1792, enduring challenges such as hostile nature, hostile diseases, hostile for Australians, and mass starvation. Eventually, slow and steady growth allowed New South Wales to show promise. By 1830, around 58,000 convicts had arrived in Australia, and their labor became a vital economic resource. While the convict colony had its problems in the beginning, it became clear that the British were here to stay in Australia. James Cook had failed to find the Terra Australis that he was ordered to find on his first voyage, concluding that the name Terra Australis was now for land in the far, far south. His second voyage, starting in 1772, set out to find what lay in the far south by circumnavigating it and came across New Caledonia, the South Sandwich Islands, and South Georgia in the process. Cook's second voyage sometimes took him to between the latitudes of 60 degrees south and 70 degrees south where he met dense ice packs and fog that forced him to turn back. Cook concluded that whatever Terra Australis was left in the world would be in, in that inaccessible icy extreme. In 1820, three contenders, Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen, a Russian Navy officer, Edward Bransfield in the Royal Navy, and Nathaniel Palmer, a U.S. sealing captain, all possibly spotted the icy continent. Exploration of the far southern regions leading, leading into the 1800s was driven by commercial interest and the need to map magnetic and cartographic features. Many sealers traveled to the south to hunt. This boom and activity led to the near extinction of the southern fur seal. The desire to chart Earth's magnetic field for navigation was a significant driver for these expeditions. Geomagnetic surveying motivated the discoveries of landmarks like the Ross Sea, the Ross Ice Shelf, the Victoria Land Coast, Adele Land, and a large section of the East Antarctic Coast. Icy seas and failures in, the, in finding the Northwest Passage in the Arctic starting in the 1840s led to a lull in exploring more of the Antarctic. However, in 1895, scientists agreed that a more in-depth exploration of Antarctica would help all of science and that the frozen continent should be explored. This cut their arms to finally fill in the last remaining blanks on the map, drew out adventurous men looking for fame, glory, or prestige for their nation. The Belgian ship Belgica, led by Adrien de Galac, was the first to winter in, in Antarctic waters. From March 1898 to March 1899, it got stuck in ice in the Bellingshausen Sea and drifted. The British National Antarctic Expedition, between 1901 and 04, headed by Robert Falcon Scott on the, on the discovery, set a new southern record by reaching 80, 82 degrees south on the Ross Ice Shelf on December 30, 1902, with Scott, Ernest H. Stockleton, and Edward A. Wilson. Scott even went up in a tide balloon, and Stockleton used motorized transport on, at Cape Royds, Ross Island, during the Nimrod expedition of 1907 and 09. France, Germany and Sweden also set out early expeditions during this period, deemed the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. A leading selling point for the heroic age was to be the first person and nation to reach the Earth's South Pole. 
Shaku Tenaro had already tried but failed to reach it with the Nirmar expedition. Now it was Scott's turn to try again. Scott landed on Ross Island in 1911 on the ship Terra Nova, determined to conquer the pole. Scott was competing against Roald Amundsen, a Norwegian explorer. Amundsen was, was experienced. He knew how to navigate the frozen ex extremes of the Earth, going as far as to fully navigate the Northwest Passage. Here, local Inuit people taught him how to survive the Arctic cold. When he heard he was too late to be the first man to reach the North Pole, he secretly changed plans and intended to be the first man to reach the South. Amun Sen set up his base closer to the Pole and was not bound by scientific obligations, unlike Scott. Amun Sen would head straight to the Pole and head right back. When the conditions were right, Amun Sen began his journey on October 11th, 1911. Scott started on the 1st of November. Amundsen's skis and sled dogs carried him and his men along an untested passage through the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. Scott relied on ponies to pull, pull his supplies. When they grew too weak to continue, they were shot, and Scott's team had to pull their supplies by hand. Finally, on January 17, 1912, Scott and his men reached the South Pole but were devastated by the sight they saw, a Norwegian flag planted by Amundsen and his crew over a month prior, flew in the wind as if it taunted them. They had no choice but to turn back. Little did he know that he had just entered a death march. While the current predictions about the weather at the time told Scott that the temperatures would be survivable, 1912 was an anomaly. On February 17th, Edgar Evans died of frostbite, the first death in the expedition. Frostbitten, Lawrence Oates followed a month later after sacrificing himself in a blizzard to avoid slowing down the team. I am just going outside and may be some time, he said, before leaving the group's tent and vanishing. Scott, Dr. Edward Wilson, and Henry Bowers continued the trek back, but were caught in another blizzard. We shall stick it out to the end, but we are getting weaker of course, and the end cannot be far, Scott wrote in his last diary entry dated March 29, 1912. It seems a pity but I do not think I can write more. The failure of the ill-fated Terra Nova expedition did not bring an end to Antarctic exploration. Shackleton once again led another expedition in 1914, the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition, aiming to be the first to sled across Antarctica from one coast to the other. However, their ship, the Endurance, got stuck in ice in the Wendell Sea. Over the winter of 1915, it drifted north and eventually got crushed by pack ice, sinking and leading to a struggle for survival. Shakutan and his crew had to camp on an ice floe for five months. When the floe broke up, in April 1916, they set off in three small lifeboats for the unhab uninhabited Elephant Island, over 100 miles away. They reached it eight days later. Shakutan and five others then embarked on a 500 mile journey to get help in South Georgia. Landing on the uninhabited side, and tracked across the unmapped island to, to the Norwegian whaling station at Stromness, arriving 17 days later. It took an additional 105 days for a rescue team to reach the men Shakutan had left on Elephant Island in August. Remarkably, all 28 survived. In 1922, Shakutan joined forces with Roet for an expedition on the Quest, a converted seal hunting boat. Unfortunately, the quest was too small to break through pack ice. Shakutan unexpectedly died of a heart attack just before landing in South Georgia. The death of Shackleton typically marks the end of the heroic age of Antarctic exploration, as explorers began to be equipped with, with modern luxuries and gadgets like heating, airplanes, radio, etc. Gone were the days of brute force and survival in the most inhospitable continent on Earth. In the act of reaching the South Pole, Scott and Amundsen had proven that a mythical continent that kept the world from falling over had not existed, nor that it was the green, lush, harmonious paradise that supposed visitors had described it as. But their journeys and the voyages of many others, whether intentional or not, discovered that two individual continents had existed in its place. The Dutch were the first Europeans to reach the continent of Australia in the 1600s, for which they inevitably named New Holland. The unknown western coast became the site of various shipwrecks as it was slowly charted. 
some that resulted in horrific accidents of desperate survival, and others that turned in, into tales of safe returns. Stories of the New Continent were spun into stories and books, serving as utopian escapes from the hard hardships of their time, while simultaneously becoming dystopias in of themselves. English editions of these books became especially popular as, much like the Dutch, English ships started to run aground on the continent. The beginning of the Age of Enlightenment and the resulting frenzy for science sent ships from France and Britain to scout out Australia and New Zealand drew Roswell powers in search of colonies. After James Cook had completed the map of New Zealand and Eastern Australia, the British gained dominance in the land and it soon became a penal colony. A similar rush occurred at the turn of the 19th century when scientists and explorers began funding expeditions to uncover what truly lay at the southern extreme of the globe. What they came across was an icy, barren continent of which they named Antarctica. Europe's quest for Terra Australis may not have unveiled the fabled southern continent, but it marked a transformative period in history. The expeditions, scientific advancements, and the resulting maps reshaped the European worldview. It was a quest that, despite its lack of a fairytale ending, shaped the course of history and humanity's understanding of the globe.